Whoa, this will be the first. Ki- oh, no, this will be the second podcast that goes up since we rebranded. Third, yes. third. This will be the third. So those of you that blinked last couple of podcasts, we right. are now arguing agile. Oh, all right. It's the only <laughs> podcast where a product person and a team person can uh, disagree on a podcast. Is that true? Probably. Well, it is on this podcast. That's true. Oh. Within the confines of this podcast, that's absolutely true. Oh, I thought everyone else had to do whatever their uh, corporate overlords tell them. Uh, that's unfortunately those poor souls are. <laughs> it's all true. It's all, also true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A situation came up recently for me where I was wondering what your take would be, and that situation was a failed sprint. A failed sprint. A failed sprint. Yeah, sprints can fail, right? As we all tend to kind of assume that sprints will work, like be successful. At, successful at all costs. At all co- yeah, unfortunately, at all costs. <laughs> but sometimes happens and, 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 and sprints fail. So the first question there um, is, how do we know a sprint failed? Like, what's our barometer for saying the sprint has succeeded or failed? Oh, how, yeah. What do we look at? Yeah, that's easy for me because uh, as a product person, I'm like, well, did you accomplish the sprint goal? And if the answer is no, then I'm going to mark a zero in that category uh, rather than a one or an X rather than a zero, whatever. Like, yeah. And uh, we're going to call it a failure and uh, we're going to talk about w- like what we learned and uh, move along and try to absorb that in the next sprint. So I'm glad you brought up sprint goals because I was shocked to learn that a lot of people out there do not use sprint goals. If you're not using sprint goals, you need to do that. Yeah. Because without that, you don't know if you're hitting your goals or it's being successful or not. So let's assume you have sprint goals, Mm -hmm. which by the way, are not the scrum masters doing. They don't create the sprint goals. Oh boy. Right? The sprint sprint goals are created, or at least they are initiated by the product person to say, here's what I would like the team to focus on in the upcoming sprint. Now the team members can look at that and say, in order to do that, we also need this other thing. Yeah. And so there's some negotiation there. It's a negotiation, yeah. The scrum guide said, like just to throw out what the book says, right? Says that the sprint goal is a negotiation. However, the product person is the person to lead the conversation, lead off the conversation, or I guess the first person to throw out a number, (laughs) the first person to show their hand. I don't like, I I don't know. I'm all a lot of euphemisms. Yeah. They they actually start the thing off and then there's a dialogue that ensues. And the net result is through the negotiation that we just talked about, there is a goal, which is then determined, agreed upon by everybody, including Mm -hmm. the team members. Yeah. And then the goal should always be visible at all times throughout the sprint. Think about it. Think about any kind of sport that you want that has a goal in it, right? There's a lot of sports that have goals. Sure. If you can't see the goal, the goalposts, right, and the crossbar or whatever you have, Mm -hmm. how do you aim? Where do you shoot? How do you know if you actually scored? So you have to have the goal visible. And I suggest those people that are synchronizing daily to collaborate across the sprint always look at that and say hey guys what are we working on right. folks i keep right. saying guys but it, of course that means everybody so i'll say folks look at whatever somebody comes up with let's say robert here comes up with this nice shiny tool that he's just thought about or developed or whatever or evaluated and says to the team hey we need to do this how does that contribute to the sprint goal because you're consuming capacity from the goal in doing all of these things yeah so that should be the lead off yeah. And if you're not contributing to the goal, then you need to bring in the person who set the goal and say, we suddenly found a need for X. Yeah. It wasn't in the goal. What do you suggest? Yeah. A lot of teams, I would expect the pushback for this to be, well, my sprint goal is to get X and Y and Z done. Like just, just like, just not really well thought out sprint goals. And, and in a lot of businesses, especially businesses that are out, like I like to pick on sales driven businesses because a lot of people live in that reality. It is a reality, so it would not be good of us to ignore it, right? So let's let's deal with it head on because I've, I've worked in sales oriented, like the all the ideas come from sales, right? Yes. At, at a company like that, the sprint goal might be, well, finish this feature and fix this bug and do whatever 
because those like those are all the number one priorities well what are the number one priorities what's the number one priority all of them all of them are the number one it, they're companies like that as a product person the way that i have dealt with that is i negotiate could be with the team could be away from the team usually it's away from the team i negotiate and i pick one thing and i get consensus from leadership we have to solve this thing next Usually it's the thing that bubbles up to the roadmap and it's not one of these one-off, two-off things. Sometimes it's not, but usually it's one of the, the, the thing that bubbles up to the roadmap. And I'll say, well, the sprint goal of the next sprint is to focus on getting traction on this roadmap item. That does not mean that all those little, little one-off things that we've promised or uh, uh, important things in the infrastructure that we have to deal with or end of uh, license, license renewals or what things like that. Doesn't mean we're not gonna focus on that stuff. It just means this is the number one priority and this is what I value over and above everything else. So if this thing is in jeopardy, feel free to drop everything else in the sprint. Yeah, so I think the way you're going with that is the quality of the sprint goal, right? Yeah. And how that's how that's crafted and communicated. Right. I, I absolutely agree that that is critical. There's some nebulous sprint goals out there, right? So improve this. How do you know if it's improved? Is it improved a little bit? Yeah. Right? So, yes. So the onus there is on the person who is creating the sprint goals to create them in a way that, A, is it makes it very clear what the objective is so the team can get after it and know when they've got there yeah. right and then b to your point which i think is absolutely critical as well which is relatively speaking you have this goal but the team also has these other things that they know they have to do mm -hmm. give them the leeway to either drop those things to meet the sprint goal if yeah. it's critical if not just say it, it would be good to meet the goal not it is critical to meet the goal. Right. Give them some direction, right? right? So they can actually march down that path and, and make yeah. it happen for you. The old adage is make it quantifiable. But, and I used to do that in my yeah, younger yeah. days and say, yeah. Yeah, if it's not quantifiable, it's not good. I, I've actually retracted from that quite a bit because I think it depends on the team maturity. Team members know instinctively what you mean if they've worked with you for a while they know so you don't have to say improve this by 37 percent you yeah, can yeah, say yeah. i'm looking for roughly a third right that kind of thing so i'm not really sold on this 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 quantifiable thing anymore but it has to be clear has to be concise and it has to have the opportunity cost in there mm -hmm. in order to meet this you may sacrifice this and i'm okay with that yeah it's a tacit permission yeah. to do that yeah well, it's like, think about the waterfall organizations or the people doing Agile that also require Gantt charts at the same time somehow, like the people no are doing Agile, that, right? and, yeah, Agile in name only. The people do Gantt charts with like critical path. Remember the critical path? Yeah. Of course. Well, like they'll be like, well, this is a critical path. The Like think about a, a, a project manager, Agile project manager. I don't know why I'm, why I have to twist it so much to bring this up to, I, I do it to illustrate the point. The point being, think about even if your organization doesn't have the best implementation of agility, if you had that chart of the critical path here is the only thing that matters and everything else can flex. So I have dates here that we've kind of committed to promise, like the project manager's promise or whatever. But imagine a world where they've promised some dates, but literally everything is flexible on that chart, except the critical path but they're willing to divert any resources or clear any blockers out of the way of the critical path. It's that kind of singular dedication that I'm talking about in the sprint goal. That's why I think the sprint goal shouldn't be all over the place. I even used to, earlier in, in my product owner career, product owner, product ownership career. I don't know. Uh, or, or like <clears throat> years ago, I used to, that's a better way to do it. <laughs> years, Ye ago. years ago, I, time. I used to say, Hey, the sprint goal is to get this mobile release out and then to get this bug fix done. And I, my sprint goals look like that. And over time I was like, when you're dividing your sprint goal, you're not high. Like there's ambiguity now. And w well, what's m the most important thing? Uh, there's ambiguity to the team and I was like if I'm not if I the product person am not painting a absolutely clear picture of this is the burning most important thing to the company then I'm not doing a great job yeah I agree I think I think that's true I th that's what I meant by the opportunity cost you could say well we need to have this right so the the the, the word need 
right? We need to have this. Yeah. We want this. We would like this. We desire this. We wish for this. All of those in the, are in that sequence. And the team then takes the directive that the need trumps everything else. Right. Once you can fulfill the need, feel free to ha- you know go at something else. Right. But flip side of that, you do not want to sacrifice anything that gets us to the need in lieu of something else. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. I, so that's what you know. That's what I meant. I, in the past, I would I would say, well, yeah, this is a good sprint goal. You know, look at this. I need this. I need this. I need this. And then you tell the teams that, and they're like, uh, right. So it is up to the product owner to be absolutely clear on what the sprint goals are. Yeah. And, and once you do that, I think the results are pretty. It's a quick feedback on that one. Uh, within a sprint or two, you will see your teams pivoting to that. So will they get everything done on that list? No, but you, that is not the goal. Mm-hmm. That's important for people to realize. A lot of times what people tell me is, well, we didn't meet our sprint goals, plural. Uh, how many did you have? They go five, right? Which ones were absolutely critical? All of them. So that <laughs> goes back to your point about everything's priority one. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I tell people, well, what's one A? What's one B? Yeah, right. There yeah. can only be one priority one, right? That's there, why it's there, a one. There can be only one. Yeah. So, so yes, it, it, this is on the product owner to set the right direction. The team will follow. We talked about failed sprints. This is one that I don't have an opinion on. Should I, the product person, be tracking successful versus failed sprints? Absolutely. You're setting the you're setting the sprint goal, right? What am I going to so, do with that number if I track it? Like what? You're, I, you're not tracking numbers necessarily, but we're, what you're tracking is was this sprint successful? Yeah. Right. So so the goal, by virtue of being a goal, think about the sports metaphor again. Mm-hmm. There's a goal. I'll use soccer because my favorite sport. Sure. But it doesn't matter. You, you could you could have any sport here, ice hockey. We track things in these sports, right? We we don't track just the goals. We track the number of shots on goal. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, right? Uh, we also, these days, of course, right, uh, we track the number of shots that were off the goal. But yeah, so the reason for that is at least where the goal is when you're tracking that stuff. As a product owner, you care if the sprint is successful. You don't necessarily care. I'm probably going to put myself out on a limb here. You don't necessarily care how many shots were off goal. Right. Because you're only counting the ones that made it in the yeah. net, so to speak, right? So yes, you should be counting that. Now, I'm not suggesting you count a metric or of any kind necessarily, but you go back to the goals that you yourself outlined and say, number one is, this is what I want out of it. Number two is, this would be nice to have. If yeah. they get number one, it's not a fail in my book. But the team then needs to look at that and say, could we have done better at two? Yeah, you know, when I improve. like when I brought this up, I was thinking about the product owner tracking it, and now that I, now that we're talking about it, uh, I'm thinking I don't know if I am the right person to track. I think the scrum master on the team would be the appropriate person to track it because, like, as a product person, I, like I have to live in the world where the sprint goal was failed, and I have to communicate back to all that. Like, I have to pay for that. You do, and that's why you should track it, right? All the scrum well, master is well, going to do is say, "I mean, I can it track is what it is. I can track it, but like the, but I can track it, but the team is are the ones who have to have a real conversation about why and what can we do, and you know, what I mean, like I, I see where I, you're going. I, with I that. can track it, but like, oh, I mean, what am I going to do over time? I'm just going to show a trend, and I can't. Like, what am I going to do with that trend? I don't have any supervisor. Oh, hopefully, don't have any supervisory capacity or whatever over the team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you could say like, well, the product person is a member of the team, so they do share in that responsibility a bit, right? Uh, like, but a, as a regular course of action, introspection on how we performed and why we performed the way we did, whether it was good, bad, or ugly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The scrum master is a facilitator of that, and the team is on the hook to look at that and say, what happened? How could we have? avoided the things that were not good yeah right going forward because to your point you don't want a trend of the same thing a trend going right. forward yeah a trend. Yeah. when you have that it's already too late but if you have a trend of two data points you can now look back at the previous one and go why are we repeating the same mistake or right. what are we doing wrong that's causing us to fail the same way yeah those things can be facilitated by the scrum master absolutely with the team the product person is, however, tracking the fact that only so much got done. Mm-hmm. And to your point, you own that, right? To the you owe it, you own it, and you owe it to the business. Yeah. So the communication comes from you, right? But it goes both ways, I think. I, I think the communication should also be to the team. Help me understand 
why what happened happened yeah and if the teams already had their retrospective they were able to say here's what happened here are steps we're taking to make sure we don't fall foul of the same things that we've done in the past yeah and looking at that you either remain convinced that the team is actually improving going forward but which again you can you can't decide there you can only decide to sprint out or maybe maybe more or you can say well i'm not convinced you you said that last sprint and here we are sprint 3 we've repeated the same mistake right yeah. if that happens i would be looking at the scrum master to say work with your team why are we doing that that should never be the case because the idea is incremental improvements that says sprint x from x minus 1 should be better and x plus 1 will be yeah. even better yeah it's, it, you know that worries me because now it now the product person and the team uh, we're becoming a us and them or me and them type you, you of know, you, product person is part of the team yeah, but yeah. It, but it, but again it's like I, i'm part of the team but if we work together to set the goal and the team committed and said yes this goal is acceptable and we agree it's within our, our reach mm -hmm. to do in one sprint Yep. And then the team failed at doing that goal. And then you look back and you're like, well, actually, 80% of the time over the past five sprints, you have failed the goal. The product person now, like that's a, it's a very sticky conversation you're walking into because you're walking into a, you're walking into a situation where you're like, you're backed up by metrics. And again, assuming that the team was fully participated in the negotiation of the sprint goal. Right, and we're not working in a shop where the team got fed this like you yeah. will do this this sprint, oh, right? Yeah. Or, or there's some some kind of heavy handedness about like you agree to this, right? Right? We're putting that aside for a second and assuming that's not the problem. You're coming with metrics of a trend yes. of the team's performance. The reason I'm kind of digging here is because I work with teams that are all contractors, and too many sprints like that with a team of contractors. That doesn't turn out good. That gets the all. That gets the whole team bounced. And Absolutely. Yeah. So when, when you have in that example, if you've got if you've got more than two data points in a row that are below the line, so to speak. Yeah. I wouldn't wait till you get three, four, five. <laughs> I mean, I would certainly be working with the team and say, <laughs> yeah. "Hey, tell me, right, what I'm doing wrong in setting these sprint goals such that we're not meeting them. Yeah. Am I being too aggressive? You know, let's look at the underlying reasons." They could vary all over the place, right? It could be oh, we had dependencies on external teams and they didn't meet them. Okay, but that can't happen sprint in, sprint out, right? Yeah. So, yeah, one-offs, okay, but you don't want those one-offs to become a trend. Even a trend of two to three data points, that should not be the case. Yeah. If that is the case, you have to have deeper conversations about a couple of other things. Is the team really not capable? Are they not negotiating and they're just saying yes to everything? Right, yeah. Or what's happening is they're really running into headwinds because they're dealing with new technology yeah. and all of those things can help kind of ameliorate future sprint goals to the point where you get it's that cone again right so you you get closer to completion uh, and then the last thing i'll say on this is the definition of success or flip side of that how we started fa uh, failed sprint goals yeah. maybe we need to look at that and say well the entire sprint didn't fail we actually did these three things very well oh yeah but we didn't meet the goal. Yeah. So let's take the positives from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's not on here in our discussion points, but it probably should have been, which is a, a partial success or 50 50. I don't know. Like a, when you say partial success, it kind of sounds like it's, it has a negative connotation to it, but it, it's not meant to be. It's like uh, we succeeded toward the goal, but not all the way towards the goal. Yeah. I certainly would be willing, if I'm tracking a trend, I certainly would be willing to show because here's the way I would think about the trend. The trend is either down, which is a failure, flat even line. even yeah. flatline, yeah, flatline, which is partial, or up, which is a success. Mm -hmm. And that's that's <laughs> that's basically the the way I would show the trend chart. But I, I was going up and and gaining with more and more and more success over time, or falling with subsequent failures, or just flatline because we are, we're not really making progress. We encountered things, we made a little bit towards a goal, and then we kind of abandoned it. I asked for a API to be built one time, an API to be built to deliver some information. And when the product was in mid sprint, we found out that it was gonna take a lot more work to connect to the underlying system to get what we needed. And at the end of the sprint, we didn't meet the sprinkle and i'm like instead of not meeting the sprinkle and having nothing to deliver 
why didn't you just stub out the API response? Yeah, mock it up, yeah, and and make it and mock it up yeah. so that so that you're done. But like basically, you're still trying to figure out how to connect to the outside system or whatever. But the API and the delivery mechanism for the information, it's done and loaded, and we can demo it, and you, know, you can go into Postman or whatever mm-hmm. and load the JSON response and show it. I was like, why didn't you just do that and and just say like, hey, we have a little more work to do. But the goal was to get you an API you can work with, get you some integration with your scripts or whatever, and we've done all that. It's just the response that comes back is n- wrong. Sure, <laughs> but but at least you have the quote unquote contract, right? Right. Yeah. So, so I agree. I, I think that that becomes a I think that becomes a coaching point, a coachable moment. However, people say that nowadays. Well, this is like again, we go back to the episode when Fred was on. Fred's like, it you should be creating together, and it should be fun. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. and, and like this is what I think of is like, well, how can we still meet the goal, even though we're having these deep problems? Oh, I know what we can do. We can we can do all of what's asked for, and we'll have this little tiny problem. What appears to be a little tiny problem, right? It returns the wrong the wrong response. So we couldn't go live with that tiny problem. No, however, no, we've come a live. long way. You can go live. Well, it's just the response just the wrong. is wrong. <laughs> yeah, but and you'll so, say, well, well, we know it's wrong. Right. But is it like here's the existential agile software development question is it better to have software in your hands that works but the output is wrong than to have no software at all well that's a clear that's a clear answer but ultimately the team has to decide based on you know their definition done are you done with that yeah right you're not done with it because the response is wrong but you're a long way forward right there's that little piece that's missing uh yeah well we can definitely argue about whether the sprint goal has succeeded or or not succeeded or partially succeeded. I would argue in that instance, like it, it you have a problem, it were partially succeeded. Yep. You know, you, there's you, value you there. did deliver what you said, but there are problems with it. Yes. Yes. However, in what you've delivered, there is value, right? There is value. Yes. It's not just not a hundred percent of it, but there's value. So yeah, right. I agree. The bigger conversation around this is one that I feel nobody's really doing very well, which is when the team fails, we're going to go back to saying they're failing a sprint goal, right? When the team is failing a sprint goal, how does the team hold themselves accountable? Because I've been in a lot of organizations where like finger pointing and blame game was the, was the order of the day. Mm -hmm. And if the team doesn't step up and say, we made a mistake and this is what we're doing to fix it quickly, somebody in the organization will come calling yeah it's like <laughs> somebody looking to make a name for themselves will make a name stepping up on your team and launching themselves forward like you need to be accountable first before anybody makes you accountable i, I guess i know i'm not pitching it very well no, but, but that- I, I know where you're going with it i mean anytime a a team this is gonna sound weird anytime a team like fails it. the sprint goal yeah they should obviously be introspecting right to figure out what went wrong and how to make sure it doesn't happen again I'd say the other side of it is true too. If you didn't fail a sprint goal, but you met it, you should still be introspecting and saying, what did we do well? Let's just keep doing what we're doing because it's working, right? In either scenario, whether the sprint goal was failed or not failed or, or met, the team needs to introspect and say, how are we working together? Is this working as a team for us? What is not working? How can we pivot and ultimately make some kind of a decision on on trying something in the form of an experiment. Yeah. Try that. So instead of saying, well, here are things we're going to do going forward, which becomes more of an edict, because you have people that have strong opinions sometimes right. on the team. That go, I don't believe we should be doing that. Right. Yeah. Treat that as an experiment. That way you set it up and say, we're going to try it for a sprint or two. If it doesn't work, we can always go back to something else. Yeah. Or we'll, re-pivot, we'll re-examine this then. We'll pivot from there. But it is an experiment. It's not permanent. Right. Unless the team agrees that it's working well, then we can say, okay, let's keep doing this. So the answer is that the team always must introspect and change things up. It's failing or not failing in either case. In an organization where like the blame game, like somebody is always looking for someone to blame is the culture saying like standing up and saying we were wrong first 
Actually, I was trying to make a point, but uh, like while I was talking through it, I'm thinking like if you stand up and say you're wrong first, like no one, nobody can really blame you at that point. I worked with a manager one time who was, uh, I think I was an employee and he was a manager at that, at that point in time. And uh, he would always be the first to, to stand up and say like, okay, uh, well, uh, I think maybe uh, I could have done something uh, different and I'm wrong. I, maybe I was wrong. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. But what can we do going forward? And he would like basically disarm the tension by he would just accept he, he was a developer so he like he could have got away with murder and he would have been like oh my bad i'm sorry like what can we do they they would couldn't have gotten rid of him but he would disarm the conversation by saying maybe i'm wrong i apologize or whatever but what can we do and then he would move the conversation forward very quickly by doing that that's actually a really good leadership trait being vulnerable right yeah there's that and then the other partner to that is is probably not in this context but you know when, whenever you do have a lighter moment it's never at the expense of somebody else on the team or outside it's always on you yeah. self-deprecating humor Th- those things really help to as you say disarm the audience when you're about to deliver the message you say well listen maybe my it was my fault i wasn't clear on the sprint goals or or whoever a quality person like quality lead could, or a qa person could say Maybe I missed some test scenarios here. And here's what I'm doing to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. That's all they want to hear is they want to say they want to hear accountability. They want to hear somebody saying it, it might have been my fault, but also here's something that I'm doing about that to make yeah. sure it doesn't happen going forward. But if you uh, cover those bases, I think people are good with that. Yeah, but like what I like the reason I brought this up is because I'm used to being in a lot of organizations where uh, finger pointing is the first thing that happens. True. Rather than saying like, well, you could stand up and say, well, maybe like I, I, as a product person, I do this a lot. I, as a product person, I would be like, well, maybe I should have done more time up front or whatever. Uh, I mean, like I, reality, I, I'll say that to kind of dis the tension of the situation, but I don't know if that really is helping in the long run. I think that the reason that you have uh, a significant amount of time recommended by the Scrum Guide for sprint planning is to sit down and really go in depth in every work item you're about to take on. I'm, I'm talking in depth to figure out how you're gonna implement it. Cause, that, cause again, going to this future podcast that we're gonna talk about, about uh, accounting and software development, that planning time, once you're done with that planning time and you start the sprint, you start active development, you're not supposed to go back to that planning time. It's not supposed to be a little bit of planning and then work for two days and then back to planning and then work for two right. days. It's I give you that four hour block, whatever, eight hour block, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Depending on your sprint length, yeah. And you, that's when you do your planning. So if you need to call people in the room, if you need to get your experts in, if you need to get people from other teams in, if you need to get subject matter experts in, you book them in that time mm-hmm. and you get your planning done out of the way. And then we it goes back to our other podcasts so like, well, maybe you know, if that doesn't work for your business or if you're a distributor, if you have problems with that or whatever, then maybe we break the sprint planning up where we, when we do the sprint planning, it starts a sprint. It's Tuesday between the hours of noon and 4 p.m. We take four hours and we do planning now. But then next week on Tuesday, we do the other half of sprint planning, even though I don't, I don't, at that point you're doing a one-week sprint. I don't know, whatever, weird. But the, the point is you can break up sprint planning and you know that that's your window. Yeah, yeah. In that example, one one-week sprints, you you would not be doing four hours sprint yeah, you planning. Would, yeah. Um, but to your point, so that one thing I've, I've seen work quite successfully is leaving the sprint planning let's say let's say you're doing a two-week sprint so that would be what a four-hour sprint planning event leaving that event on the calendar as as four hours ahead of time having a couple of others at least one possibly two other events which are the refinement and then leading into the refinement it would be the pre-refinement which probably doesn't even need everybody on the team it's really the business setting some expectations and not prioritizing necessarily, but ordering the backlog. Right. And the Scrum Guide talks about ordering, but a lot of people use the two terms synonymously, right? Prioritization is another form of ordering. Yeah. So that is their expression of desire. This is this is the order, yeah. right? That's the pre-refined. And then in the refinement, when the whole team is present, it's a subset. They're not looking at the whole backlog at that point. They're only looking at potentially looking at the, the population at the very top yeah. that they can go through. So. When it comes to sprint planning, the four hour event, in my example, you've already got the order that's been set. Yeah. It's been looked at twice already, right? So the team looks at it and they 
raise any objections or any discussion that needs to happen happens in the let's say the first hour where yeah. the POs are present yeah. and stakeholders as well because stakeholders aren't exempt from the event and they should all be encouraged to attend if they can so after the first hour the team has a pretty good idea of what they're going to target yeah so let's say there's 10 stories because the numbers work better right let's just say 10 stories that mm -hmm. they, they've come up with they look at that everybody's in agreement nodding up and down yes it is that's what it is then they the, the team says okay well let's get into this now we're going to try and you know task these out we'll start looking at dependencies in detail yeah they would they would have considered them ahead of time a little yeah. but when they get to that point where they're really breaking down the stories into tasks and looking at dependencies etc business folk don't need to stay there for that that now we're into the how uh, right? they, they don't need to. They can if they, they don't have need time. to. Yeah. So my take on this one, I work with a lot of business people that just cash out when this phase happens. I I would rather they stay in the meeting and just check their email or do whatever and zone out than be out of the room. Be in the room, put yourself on mute and and on another screen do whatever you need to do, but like my opinion on this, now that I'm 100% product, is uh, you should just hang out. Even if they're talking about stuff that's over your head or whatever, they might, they might be talking about building stuff over here, and then occasionally pop back to you and be like, "Wait a minute, do you plan to use it this way?" Right. And then, and then, like one time, one question, and then, boom, back off, you know, back offline for 45 minutes to, to chew up a problem. I'm just saying, be available. Just by being available. Uh, and like people will be like, well, Brian, I am available. They can call me or text me or send me an I am or whatever, and I'll get on the call as soon as I'm done wrapping up with whatever I'm doing and 45 yeah. minutes later or whatever. No, no, no. I'm talking now it, it, in the room sitting like so remote on the call, whatever, yeah. just muted that they can just stop and get you 15 seconds. Boom. They're back to planning. That makes a lot of sense. I, I, I think from a clarity perspective, that would be tremendously useful, right? Yeah. If they were around, so to speak, but like you said, they could you know, uh, do something else. That's not that's my experience. Okay. With, no, it's not mine either. Yeah. But you, yeah, they absolutely welcome the opportunity to say, well, I'm not needed now, right? You yeah. guys are talking yeah. techie talk, yeah. so I'm gone. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think it would be very useful if they could be convinced to stay. But again, like you, I haven't found them willing to do that too much, too often. We can try and persuade them, right? Sell them on the benefits of that, maybe, right? Uh, the, I mean, the benefits of uh, no delay time on your team. Yeah, like I shouldn't really, I shouldn't really have to persuade them on that. This is just something that I do as a product person, but I really haven't seen a lot of product people no. do it. You know? No, I haven't either. I agree, and I, I think that's a really good idea for. Those of you that are in the in the games organizing yeah, these events, yeah, the make sure they hang yeah. around. Again, like I said, they don't need to be actively engaged the whole time no. in doing because I mean, a, a lot of product people maybe they'll be out of their depth in, in some of those discussions. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not. But uh, we started down this rabbit hole by talking about holding the team accountable. I, I don't even think it's it's such a terrible label for this category, holding the team, because really the team should be looking to take accountability for what they can take accountability for. It shouldn't be that they're held accountable by somebody else in the yes. organization. Yes. You know, it, it should be, hey, hey, we don't need you to try to force account accountability on us. We know what we are accountable for because we're only accountable, the team, for what we are responsible for. My issue with this category is when the team doesn't want to take accountability for something or maybe the team is just, oh, I don't have a great way to pitch this. I see teams a lot of the time that they don't, they will blame other people for things that were not necessarily out of their control. Some things were in their control. Some things were out of their control. You know what I mean, but, but or or the other thing I see is you'll miss a deadline and you'll say, "Well, we were waiting on this other team." Oh yeah. Well, I mean, what did you try to do to get over that blocker of waiting on another team? Like, I, like yeah, you this see is a lot with dependencies on other teams. You see a lot with that, but. Well, if it comes to that point where they say, well, we were waiting on this other team upon which we're dependent, it's already too late. Uh, you know, I think a good scrum master would come in ahead of time and say, what are any blockers that you all have? You have 10 days to do this. The first time that comes up, the scrum master needs to escalate and try and resolve that. 
I've seen teams do this before as a scrum master. They'll say, oh, I did this yesterday. I work on whatever today. Oh. And uh, I've got no blockers. I'm like, you really, you got no blockers. Aren't you waiting to pick this task up? You're, so you're working on the task today because the higher priority task that you're not working on, you haven't got the output from this other team yet. Is that right? And like, they'll say, well, yeah, that's why I'm working on what I'm working on today. And I'll say, but you are blocked. Right on the highest priority thing that basically the thing that ties back to the sprinkle you are blocked on that right yes okay well like you should start with that okay Absolutely. I, start I with that and raise that as a blocker yeah raise that as an impediment in your alm tools you can have the option where they can flip something on the on the card yeah. it will show up in a different color as a blocker all the way out to creating a separate work item type called impediment or right, whatever. Right. So it, the, again, this is all down to the scrum master to kind of facilitate all this. But yes, uh, oftentimes the development team members might say, well, I'm not blocked because I'm working on something. It's not yeah. like I'm nothing to do. But to your point, yeah, you're blocked because you're not progressing toward that sprint goal, Yeah. right? Even if the second thing you're working on is getting to the sprint goal, you're still blocked. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a culture thing. You've got to get that through to your teams and encourage them to speak up when, when it comes to that. But as far as, yeah, I worked on this yesterday, that's done. You know, that's deprecated. We don't do that anymore. You know, we just simply look at that. I'm a big fan of showing the sprint goal yeah. every day at right. the stand-up and right. say, whatever you're working on, you know, is it progressing us to this goal? Yeah. And I'm not interested in the task. I'm not interested in an action. I sent an email to Mary or Fred. I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, are you progressing to this goal? In other words, will you meet this come end a sprint yeah if not why not right what is what is stopping us that's the impediment so this is yeah. where team members can say i'm on track however i'm yeah. waiting on this yeah. other team let's say it's a security team to open a firewall port for me okay well you're waiting so you, when you're waiting that time even though you're actually actively not wasting time because you're working on something else that is a blocker right, right. there and and i coach scrum masters to pick that up as a blocker right and not just say take the word at face value and say, oh, I don't have any blockers. Well, you don't have any blockers until the end of the sprint. Then you're going to say, well, we didn't get this output from this other team. Mm -hmm. It's too late then. This is the main reason why I tried to move teams to doing walk the board versus uh, three questions or sure. whatever they're using. Because in walk the board, I can start at the, I mean, I, I was going to say I can start at the most, at the highest priority item. But once things are pulled into the sprint, they're not necessarily in the same order. Yeah, they were in the backlog, mm -hmm. which is kind of like I like. <laughs> I want to kind of talk about that one, but I also want to leave it alone because I want to get through the rest of this topic. Like I don't sure. that I, like as a product person, I don't really understand that. I was like, wait, you're pulling things in that were ranked in priority order, and they are getting worked in this in the active sprint, so it's cool. But like, why would you co complete all the stuff that's lower priority before you complete the stuff that's uh, like I, that? I don't understand. No, it's, there's sometimes there's reasons behind it. Like, well, yeah, you pull in yeah. work, and then you suddenly find a couple of bugs, and I tell the team to not put them at the bottom because it's out of sight, out of mind. You're just working on the stories that are se sequenced in the right way, as, and they're right in sequencing it that way. But yeah. those bugs have to be fixed. Yeah. So I flip it and say, well, let's talk about the bugs because if they're not, they become blockers if they're not right. resolved. But yeah, that's, that doesn't matter. I mean, let the team figure out the ordering and everything else based on how they work together. Uh, I, I do, but it doesn't make me any less nervous yeah. to be like, wait a <laughs> you're starting on all this stuff that's not priority. Uh, what about the sprint goal? Going back to the assumption that like the sprint goal, like let's say I pull five things into my uh, sprint for the commitment and uh, only three of those things are tied to the sprint goal and two of them are like extra stretch goals whatever and i'm like why are you working on the yeah that's a different story right there if they're yeah, working is, on stretch yeah. goals right. as opposed to things that they say well we're, we looked at these goals but in order to meet one of them we have to do this other thing right so you're yeah. still working towards the goal it's yeah. just that you need this other thing okay i understand that yeah but yeah if they're working on those stretch goals to me a stretch goal is only in the picture once you meet a goal then yeah. you're stretching well, I don't even want to put like this. Uh, this is why I said about this is why we, I talked about the setting the sprint goal being a singular focus because I don't even want to put the the stretch goals into the sprint goal. Uh, it, it, it makes sense to say, well, the sprint goal is to deliver feature A, but the stretch goal is to fix this bug with feature C that we delivered two sprints ago, and maybe to look into why this is happening with this other feature or whatever. I almost don't even want to put those in the sprinkle. I almost want to, I want to keep focus to say, 
the goal is to deliver feature A, period. And if the team's like, well, we have extra capacity, this is not going to take us a whole sprint. I'll be like, cool. You can take in what you want to take in, but the sprint goal is these three out of five stories that have to do with feature A. Right. So when I see other things in progress that are not related to the sprint goal, I get super nervous as a product person. Some of it is by virtue of you as a PO defining a stretch goal, right? You're kind of making it easier for the team to say, well, I'm working on the goal for sure. I, I hear you loud and clear. Now I'm blocked. Rather than sit here and twirl my thumbs, I'm going to work on this other thing. And then off they go, right? They're working on the, the goal, but they're blocked and they're working. Let's say they're waiting on some other team to come back to them for that that high priority, you know, the yeah. goal, the goal yeah. itself. But they already started this other thing while they were waiting. Right. And they're so far into it, it doesn't make sense to stop now. Right. That's the opportunity cost coming up right there. While you're finishing that, having heard the answer back from the team you're waiting on, you're now running the risk of not meeting the sprint goal. I don't like red that. flag, red flag, red flag everywhere for me. I don't like that at all. I don't either. So this is why if you didn't have those stretch goals, then the focus will be what's stopping you. Right. Well, this blocker. Okay, well, let's resolve that. Yeah. Just stay on it sharp, right? That That's preferable for me. I'm I'm uh, 100% okay to say I'm not going to have the stretch goals. And if you're blocked, I want you like standing. Like, remember the days where if you had a problem, you would go stand at someone's desk <laughs> yes. and stand, stand over the them. Shoulder. Yeah, stand over them the whole time. Like that's yeah. I want that. I want us. Yeah. I, I like because I as a product person would be the one to do that. I'd be standing over someone to be like, I'll wait until you're done. I'm patient. I can't go back to work anyway. I'll wait until you're done because it's very important. I get your time. <laughs> Yeah, and you want me to go away? Give me some time. I'm blocked <laughs> on what I'm doing, and I need your help, so please yeah. help me. Yeah, I don't know. We went on two separate tangents with holding the team accountable. I like The team has to hold itself accountable. That's the takeaway here. Absolutely. I think that also is a factor of the, the, the level of agile maturity of the team. Uh, it's also difficult to do when you don't have a scrum master. <laughs> it's very difficult to do when you don't have a scrum master. It's Everybody could be an expert in their own field, as is the case in, say, the orchestra team members, right, of, of a musical orchestra. Yeah. The brass section, you know, violin, whatever the strings, or how, whatever, what you have. They're all experts, but without the conductor... All that stuff is going to sound like noise. Yeah. So yes, you do need somebody to facilitate, really. So I agree with you. I agree with you. It's it's very difficult to do if you don't have somebody who can stand there and say, "Hey, listen, I'm just going to make sure that things are being done right." You know, and you're there as a product person to make sure the right things are being done. I don't know. I have this conversation on a regular basis. I, I would say almost every month with different people. We can make sure we're trying to learn from our mistakes, but the person whose job, the singular person whose job it is to make sure that the team is improving constantly. This is, that's the total job of the Scrum Master, to make sure your the team is improving from where they were, whatever, a, a month ago, a week ago, well, but previously, previously. And uh, without a permanent <laughs> without a permanent person doing that, I mean, are you going to put that on somebody else in the organization? Like, it's not going to be their full-time job. So basically what you're saying is it's someone's part-time job to, and not only just part-time, like, way part <laughs> yeah there's part time and then there's way part-time. like they have a 40 hour yeah. job of doing whatever their normal job is and then this is extra time on top of that yeah that, you know. that just doesn't work and also right. i have a thing for us to talk about which is sharing mistakes like the, the shared failures between teams that it fits into this category because if if like from a uh, budgetary perspective just from the numbers of paying people to work you are paying for failures right yeah you pay for all the successes you try to say that like oh i don't i i don't want any failure on my team or whatever but that's not reality like let's be be serious for a second for people to make mistakes and fail and have to do it over again over again and succeed so let's think about this for a second if you'd be willing to pay a little bit more with those failures and say for a couple more bucks I can spend time to have the person who made the failure or the team, right, or the team, that made, to spread that knowledge to the rest of my teams. If we tried this and it didn't work, and this is the reason, and we learned this, and this is what we're doing now. And to just spread that to all your other teams, 
Now, your other teams, hopefully, won't have to make the same mistake to come to the same learning. Yeah. And I understand the, the built-in mechanism for that is the retrospective, where the teams realize that they didn't do something correctly or they could have done something better. Or, or, I guess the opposite of this would be, this is what we did that was a wild success. That's also included in this mm-hmm. category. Sure. Um, but, but I've only ever been a part of one one program that did this. So, so again, much like setting sprint goals <laughs> and then setting sprint goals that are singular, this is also one of those unicorns that doesn't happen too often, which is every team has their own retrospective, but very rarely do you have an entire program or series of teams or grouping of teams or whatever having a larger level, either retrospective or learning or show and tell or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. To say, this is the time that I failed. This is how we got over it. This is what we're doing. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if you've got a scaled environment, a specific framework that requires you to do scaled retros. Yeah. But they tend to be at the end of a very, very long period. Right. People have forgotten stuff and they just want to get out of there. Yeah. So they're checking a box. Yes, we had a scaled retro. What's not there is the is the learning necessarily by all the teams to say specifically this worked or this didn't work. And if they come across that, we're not going to repeat the mistake that another team has made. Now, here's the other thing that's not there out of this, that there's really nothing lasting coming out of it. Meaning that Mm. you have the, you have the retro as a team or you have a retro as a team of teams. It doesn't matter which framework you use for scaling. You have that. And then what happens is stuff gets written down somewhere, right? and forgotten about largely. Very seldom do I see in practice people coming back to it at a point in time and go, remember that? Yeah. Are we doing that or are we not doing those things we say we would? Right. That, that is missing, which is why when I'm coaching Scrum Masters, I tell them, this is even at a team level, I tell them, look at the last retro in the next sprint, let's say a third of the way in, half of the way in, whatever, it depends on the, the items. And then just bring that up and go, well, these are the commitments we made. Are we holding true to those? Mm -hmm. And then you expand it out to across the teams. There, there, it's the scrum of scrum masters or whatever the equivalent of that is, right? In any framework of choice, right? They need to say that. They need to say, we did these things in this large retro. Yeah. Is your team aware of all of that? Are you avoiding the pitfalls? Or are you taking advantage of the lessons learned, yeah. right, out of those? If you're not doing that, then it was futile doing the exercise in the first place. It just becomes a yeah. checkbox. So I think if you're not doing that actively, build it in. That's yeah. that's my suggestion. Build it in and be very deliberate about it. Revisit those frequently. Because if you don't do that, people are just too engrossed in the day-to-day yeah. and it gets lost. I really want to do, uh, like, I think this is worthy of a whole podcast on the mechanics of actually running a program retrospective like actually running it i can think of a program retrospective when you have like three teams you know what i mean with it like a maximum team of like 10 people or so maybe you got like 30 people in a room that's pretty manageable but if you had a program of like 10 14 15 teams and you have like 300 people now it's, yeah well uh, it takes a specific I, set of facilitation skills yeah to- well it, it would have to be some kind of combination of breakout room type of group discussions For and, sure. and something that bubbles back up to the larger group. But like if we're going to stay down, like let's stay at a, at a smaller program level for a second. Like if I had th- three teams, uh, like 30 people or whatever in a room and we were in a room, I could probably run it like a normal retrospective just with a little longer times for all the specific pieces of the retrospective. Hey, throw a sticky on the board. I'm going to give you guys five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is to generate ideas and then have everyone use the same board. You'll probably have a lot of stickies and the grouping phase would be a bit longer to group Mm -hmm. things that are like, but I think once you get through the grouping phase, it probably would go pretty quick after that. Like you probably will group a lot of stuff that looks similar. Especially after you uh, deduplicate those things, because you're going to have duplicates in that scenario. Yeah. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there are some techniques that could be deployed to help you with that. Uh, specifically here, I'm thinking about techniques coming out of the, the liberating structures, mm. um, where you can, for example, you can do the, the, the one to for all type of thing, right? Where it takes a massive number of people 
and gets them very quickly into thinking about these things yeah. in, in individual breakout rooms yeah. probably today. Um, and then they come back and share the learnings and, and it keeps going on like that. But there's many, there's many others. You can actually hybridize some of those together. So it's not that you don't have the techniques at your disposal. I just yeah. don't see it being done very often. And I think a large part of that is twofold. One is there is no appetite from quote unquote leadership to do these sorts of things. Yeah, there's no. Oh, you're wasting I, time. Sixty people in one room. I, I for, agree with you, know. you that there's no. I will agree with you. There's no appetite from management to do these things. But I would certainly disagree to say that leadership most certainly has an appetite to get people together and share the learnings from the mistakes that the teams have already made. You've already paid for these. That's right. It's like features that I've already paid for that you're not rolling into production. I've already paid for it. Like, why would I not see it? Why would I not be able to look at it and judge for myself whether or not I should roll into production or not? True leadership should be wanting that and uh, and that's why yeah. i say it's management that don't want it these are the yeah. metrics driven yeah. utilization based well, folks the, well the, uh, like we yeah. had a, i think we had a thing i don't know if we had a thing to talk about this or not but the teams that are not improving again just in my opinion the teams that are not improving are the ones that are trying to hide the failures maybe they're in an environment where the failures are pinned on specific individuals and then they fire those individuals or a failure is a, a four letter word yeah. and they then they try to mitigate it that way. But blame the, I've been in a lot of environments actually where they, they try to group the failures and blame it on one person and they get rid of that one person and now they all have an out to not have to actually address any systemic or organizational level issues. They just, no, that one person was the problem when we got rid of them. So yep. pat ourselves on the back. Yep, I agree. You know, I've seen that. Break our arms, trying to reach our backs. That's right. I've seen that. Wait, only to see the same organizations keep doing that over and over, oh, and then yeah. lose really good people because oh, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. culture now. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's Absolutely. you know, you'll know that you're. Well, oh, oh, you're being unfair. How do I know? Uh, I'll let you know how you're in that an organization that's like that because it go, it's going to go like this one minute uh, you're on top and uh, you're the top guy and you're getting all the praise and the next minute you have to worry about being the one getting kicked out like is it, you're all cool and everybody's cool with you until un- you're not until you're not <laughs> exactly yes yes we've been there absolutely yeah. i agree yeah you'll but know it's very rare to see a culture where failure is not penalized if people are learning from it right then it should not be penalized but that's very rare and usually unfortunately just to kind of double down management types are the ones that are instilling this culture of thou shall not fail so when somebody fails and they get scapegoated out of the company other people see that so of course they're not going to admit to anything going yeah. wrong they're going to just paper over all these problems and so what happens there is yeah we've got all these problems everybody says it if you say it often enough, people believe it. Yeah. We have problems and then the yearly budget runs out and you either can the project or you say we need more money. Yeah. And the shameful part of it is you actually didn't need that much to begin with if you had done the process right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just I get on my high horse for that stuff. Yeah. The episode uh, uh, 60 that I just posted with Curtis, we got into this a uh, fair bit about leadership versus uh, management. Like management is seeking to control and one of the things to control would be the perception of how failure is viewed. Whereas leadership, I feel, would tackle failure head on to say, well, what what was wrong and what are we going to change? And then to push forward. Now, the part that you brought up, I can't remember how you phrase it. We're not seeking to ignore failure. Penalize them. We're not, well, we're not, we're not seeking to, yeah, we're not, we're not seeking to come down on anyone who has failed. But also, we're not trying to ignore the failure. That's right. We're trying to say, yes, the failure happened, but we want to know why. And if the why turns out to be, well, somebody was lazy or someone on purpose didn't do their due diligence, then we get into all these, into the, the this this bad area that we're that no one wants to dig into because now we have HR issues and stuff like that. Sure. That's not where we're going with this. Where we are going with this is our every failure i would like to connect are we learning and adjusting our strategy because the failure may not be the team's fault like uh, something in the business environment might have changed mm-hmm. i mean look like look at netflix right now like netflix stock oh, yeah. right now like 
Well, okay. they're being sued by their uh, own state like, uh, shareholders. Like, do you really think that Netflix has changed anything in their infrastructure and content and licensing and creation? Like, no, the environment changed around them. So let's think about failure for a second in the context of everything they've been doing for the last 10 years wildly successful mm -hmm. okay so who are we going to pin this failure on now well i mean the board members well, like yeah. they, they they're being sued yeah they're being sued so i mean like, we're gonna see <laughs> but yet to your point though it, it's the ecosystem right so maybe the the failure happened because of a a new regulatory change that now deems what the team did not fit for yeah. consumption just because there's a new regulation so you can't deploy this stuff but that's not the team's doing Right? Yeah. So we need to understand that. Maybe we could have been smarter about it and kind of foreseen the change coming. So it should have been yeah. that way, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always lessons learned there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I agree. I, I think where there's a team culture that is penalized for failures, people are going to hide things. Yeah, and yeah. You're, you're now fighting a losing battle. Yeah, well, you got to know your organization, too. I mean, like uh, part of me bringing up the the environmental thing was uh, sometimes you do everything right and you still fail. Sure. Uh, like Again, like going back to the Netflix thing, they should have known all these competitors were creeping into their market and adjusted to deal with it in, in some way, shape or form. And I'm sure they did right along the way. But here we are, I, I, I guess the to put a summary to this topic. I don't even know how we got to hear from failed sprints. I wanted to talk about this topic because uh, a lot of people will not even call it a failed sprint. They'll, <laughs> no, they will not fail at any cost. <laughs> sure. It wasn't a failure. It just wasn't a success. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. It's like, it's not day outside. It's just not night. They, they, will, they will refuse to call it yeah. a failure. I was in an organization one time that refused to call a sprint a failed sprint because uh, they're like, well, we delivered something. So it's not a failed sprint. So I'm like, your yeah, definition but the, of failure there. Yeah, but you you've know. you've basically co-opted. Well, that 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 organization was basically fighting with their product wing pretty hardcore. So they they had issues as it was, but like you should be able to say we failed the sprinkle and then have a conversation. It's the conversation that comes after saying we failed the sprinkle. Yep. And then that conversation is super important to figure out what do we do next and in the future. Mm -hmm. How do we adjust? Because if you're not learning anything from your failures, I'm really worried about you. We need to have an intervention. Yeah, you're in the right absolutely. place. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. You came you're to right. the AA. You came <laughs> to the right place. This is the AA. Absolutely. Right. Wow, what a topic. This is a great topic. Let us know what you think, though. That's wow. right. That's right. And let me know what you think about the branding, uh, rebranding. Oh, yeah. AA. Yeah. In the UK, that stands for uh, what we know as AAA here. Does it? Yeah. I could use some of that. 